a pioneer of the Caribbean diaspora in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We're doing a portrait today of Leopold Edwards. Don't go anywhere. Carb Nation is up next. to Carb Nation, I'm David Hines. You cannot talk about organization and organizing within the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area without talking about the towering presence of Leopold Edwards, um, known affectionately as Leo or Uncle Leo to generations of Caribbean uh, people here in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. On today's program, we're going to talk with Leo about that sojourn. We're going to talk about what made him start what he started, what made him endure all these decades, and to get his, his insights on some of the things uh, that are, are relevant to the Caribbean diaspora uh, in the current uh, situation. Uh, Leo, welcome to Carb Nation. Always a pleasure to be with you. Well, uh, you've been uh, first uh, found a member of this, found a member of that, found a member of the other. Even as late as the 1990s, found a member of one of the newest Caribbean organizations. What is it that has driven Leo Edwards all these decades? Well, it's fairly simple. I happen to believe that all human beings are born equal and have the right to participate fully in their societies as first-class citizens. I believe that as a child in Jamaica during the colonial era, I read that that did not apply in the United States, but I was assured that in the United States, racism was not based on race or color. It was based on culture. That's what I was taught in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that if one was cultured, one would not have those kinds of problems. And I recall being shown a movie with Step in Fetch It. And Older people, the younger people might not remember who he was, but you know, just kind of a fawning portrait of a black man. Or, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yeah. And being asked, would you want to be like that? And of course, everybody in the class said no. And uh, I said, well, that is the kind of black that is discriminated against. And then it happened that I graduated and decided to come to Harvard University because a lot of my father's friends had been graduates of Howard University Medical School, Dental School, etc. And within 48 hours, I got an education in the United States that I had not received in my previous 20 years, 22 years. I landed at Miami Airport. I took a cab to go to a hotel for which I had a reservation. I noticed the gentleman was observing me through the rearview mirror, and every two blocks he would stop and ask me, Sir, are you sure that's where you want to go? I said to him, Well, I have a reservation. Here it is. I showed it to him. And he st three times he stopped, and finally he said, Sir, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I don't think you want to go there. So, so by this time I was hungry and tired and I said, you take me wherever you think I should go. He took me to a, a broken down joint and I stayed there. I found out later on all people who had come before me that had the same experience. Um, I survived that. The next morning <coughs> I had promised my mother to send her a postcard 
saying I'd arrived safely. I saw something that looked like a pharmacy. I turned in to buy a stamp. And a lady jumped. No, well, I was standing in line. I was standing in line. And um, everybody was being served except me. But a number of the people were ladies. So I just thought they were serving ladies first. And then the ladies were served and men were there, but I still wasn't being served. And my train was about to take off for Washington. So I clapped to the gentleman <laughs> like that. And he looked and I did that and said, please, I, I'm in a hurry. And the gentleman turned red and ran to his desk, pulled out something. And a lady standing beside me jumped between me and him with his, her back to hit this man and her face to me, started talking in a loud voice, asking me, where are you from? Why are you here? I explained to her. And in a loud voice, he said, you're from the Caribbean? I said, yes. He said, Jamaica is such a beautiful place. I go there every year. The people are so hospitable. Um, and I could not understand why he was speaking this loudly. And finally, she said, well, this is, and she said, I'm from France but I come to the U.S. often. She says, well, um, what it is you want? I said, I don't need a stamp. She said, well, come with me and I'll show you how to get a stamp. And as I turned around, I realized there was a crowd, a huge crowd gathered outside the door with, pe with whites standing in the door and blacks standing behind, peeping around the corner. In, and I was totally confused. So anyhow, I got the stamp and I went out and there was a porter out there and I moved towards him to ask him what was happening. And as I moved towards him, he backed away until he got against the wall. Then he tiptoed and went up on his toes and took off his cap and bowed to me in a, until his head almost touched his knees and said to me, sir, sir, you don't look white, but you must be because you're still alive. Mm. And at that point, it dawned on me up on me what had happened. And then he showed me a sign. And the sign read, Jews, niggers, and dogs, not allowed. Now, I had not seen the sign. The fact is, had I seen the sign, it would have meant nothing to me. Because I was not, I, at that time, I knew I wasn't a Jew. I didn't know what a nigger was, and I knew I wasn't a dog. So I would have gone in anyhow. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. Here you are in the United States. Are you seeing yourself as Caribbean? Are you seeing yourself as black? Are you seeing yourself as Negro? What are you? No, I am a citizen of the world okay. who happened to be born in the uh, Caribbean. Uh -huh. Right? In Jamaica, mm -hmm. in particular, in the region of the Caribbean, with a right to live anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So, right? coming from Jamaica, with that colonial experience, you know what Jamaica had come here yeah. earlier, and in the, <coughs> first, this, the first decade of the 20th century, I'm talking about Marcus yeah, Messiah yeah, Garvey, yeah, yeah. and who confronted yeah. the system here in a way that was different from the yeah. way it was confronted before. Coming from the Caribbean, yes. do you bring a perspective to the racism? Yeah, because in the as a student, yeah. I had been deeply involved in the anti colonial struggle. Uh -huh. Right? And when Norman Manley formed the People's National Party, when the upheavals came in 38, I was confused. I didn't understand what, why people were rioting. I had to learn that at age 13. By age 15, I had become active in the People's National Party, formed by Norman Manley. I was an officer in the Fifth and Sixth Form Association, but deeply committed to the struggle for, for independence and Caribbean unity, federation, right? We participated, we participated in that organization in helping to draft the Federation document, Constitution of the Federation. We, uh, as the young students in the youth movement, 
operating under the aegis of Norman Manley and the People's National Party. We were given the assignment to draft what we thought should be included in the Constitution. We participated in that. We also drafted a prospectus for the University of the West Indies because, we, because in those days we were not taught Caribbean history. We were not taught Caribbean geography, anything. And we said, if there's going to be a federation, we must know Caribbean history and Caribbean geography. Manley gave us, therefore gave us the assignment to draft a prospectus for what a university should look like. We did that. I'm not saying that is what the basis for mm -hmm. us, but we said we, we, we contributed to that. So we were very clear about this. So you came to the United States already with a history of struggle behind of you. Okay. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. After these experiences that I told you about, the next one was that Blair Bishop, a fellow by the name of Blair, who happened to be Grantley Adams' nephew from Barbados. He was also doing philosophy with me. He had been involved in Barbados doing what I had done in Jamaica. And we were sitting in the, what was then called the punch bowl, which was the um, lunch room at Howard at that time. It was now a Blackburn Center. Right. And three African Americans were young freshmen who were discussing their experiences in the South. And one had, was talking about how he had witnessed the, the lynching of his grandfather. Blair and I were very moved by this and went over to say to, to him that we sympathized with him, we empathized with, with him, and we were involved in that same struggle. He, the three gentlemen turn, turned on us and, and abused us, and we couldn't understand it. So it is out of that, out of that, I, Blair and I then invited these three gentlemen, together with three Africans, to a meeting to discuss what do you know about the other? What does each group know about the other? That is how it started. Mm -hmm. The African Americans told us that in the Caribbean we wore grass skirts and lived in trees, that the Africans lived in jungles and hunted lions, and the Africans had negative stereotypes also of America. And then we said to them, you see what, what has happened? Here we are, we have all three groups been taught to think negatively and to have negatives to you about the other two when we ought to be unified against a common enemy. And that is how we started. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing we had at Howard at that time, the student government was dominated by one particular fraternity in, in working in unity with one particular sorority. And these, this sorority and this fraternity had lighter skinned blacks. And we said, that is not acceptable. You cannot be against discrimination and, and, and practice discrimination within the group. Mm -hmm. So we, I had become, in, by 49, I had become president of the Caribbean Students Association because, simply because of my work in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. They had just received for the first time a copy of the draft constitution, which I had read before I left Jamaica. And they asked, is there anyone who would like to chair a committee to, to do a study and report on this? And nobody did, so I held up my hand. And they were shocked that this freshman was volunteering to do it. I did it, and, I, and they were pleased. And so by, I arrived in Fort by 49, I became president of the Student Association. We then put together an alliance of the African Students Association, the Caribbean Students Association, and those sororities of darker complexion stu students, and one. But we were sensible enough to put an African American as president, somebody else as treasurer, and, so, and we became secretary. It is out of that that Paul Chen Young, of Jamaica, became the first Caribbean person ever to head the Howard University Students Association la later on, mm -hmm. right? We formed that. So we went through all of that. Coming out of that when we, when we graduated, 
we formed the Caribbean American Intercultural Organization because the friendships that had been formed within the Students Association, which included friendships with professors and students of all types, we thought should continue. And that we were committed, we were committed to continuing promoting and maintaining the triangular dialogue between Africa, the USA, and the Caribbean. Um, Leo, you've founded so many organizations. You've talked about CAIO, mm -hmm. the Caribbean St Students Association. You've founded so many organizations after that. You obviously have an abiding a belief that organizations are vital to the sustenance of a community. Yes. yes because individuals cannot do it. Mm -hmm. It is nonsense. The poor and the weak have never made progress by competing. Mm -hmm. The poor and the weak make progress only when they cooperate. As you look today and you see individualism um, becoming one of the dominant um, perspectives in our community, yes. uh, what, what do you say to the young people? That it is sad and they should not permit themselves to be fooled because those who wish to control you will always preach competition because the, the prevailing technique for control of any group is divide and rule and divide and rule requires competition in 1954 when we were involved in the anti-colonial struggle the British Foreign Office and Colonial Office put out a white paper on how to control the anti-colonial struggle. And it laid out in detail the technique of divide and rule. And very simple, five elements. Number one, flattery. Cost them nothing. But, but people who are egotistic can always be bought just by flattery. If flattery doesn't work, then you bribery. If and these things don't have to appear in any order, mm -hmm. in any specific order. First you start with flattery, then with bribery. Then if that doesn't work, the threat of force. If the threat of force doesn't work, the application of force. And if that doesn't work, then you infiltrate the organization, take it over and change its direction. That formula of divide and rule is universal and still applies to this day. And youngsters don't understand that. And they are telling me that I am looking out for myself. I am prepared for anybody who pays, work for anybody who pays me well. If you are prepared to work for anybody who pays you well, you are, a, you are in training to become an intellectual prostitute because you are for sale to the highest bidder and it is very likely that the highest bidder may be your opponent. Now, we have to be very clear about these things. And individuals cannot do it. Only the community working in unison can do it. The human spirit may be suppressed and oppressed, but the human spirit can never be annihilated. And when a people are united in search of their freedom, they will find it. A portrait of Leopold Edwards in his own words. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to talk to the person who has been there at his side, his wife, Carmen Edwards. Carib Nation is pleased to announce jazz legend Arturo Tapin and Ernest Wrangling will perform at the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center at the University of Maryland on Friday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. For more information, the website is www.afuwi.org. The telephone number is 212-759-9345. Welcome back to Carib Nation. They say alongside every good man is a better woman. We've been talking to Leo Edwards, pioneer, icon of the Caribbean community in Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We're now joined by his partner, his wife, 
uh, Mrs. Carmen Edwards. Welcome, uh, Carmen, to the show. Uh, you've lived with Leo throughout his sojourn, all the organizations that he has been involved in. What has life been living with someone who has been so involved in the community? Um, talk to us. Well, it has been interesting and um, sometimes a little overwhelming to keep pace with him because I don't know where he gets his energy, but <laughs> he just keeps going. Um, I came here in 1961 and um, for a period of orientation before going to the Jamaican Embassy. And then I was at the Jamaican Embassy for about uh, nine years and uh, went over to the World Bank. But during that time, in 1963, I became involved in CAIO. And um, I became chair of its uh, um, social and entertainment committee. And uh, we used to put on a number of functions and seminars and um, various activities for CAIO. And we were very active during that period. Um, in the early 60s and 70s, of course, we had a number of Jamaicans, not Jamaicans, only Caribbean people, who were interested in working for Jamaica and the Caribbean. And um, that continued into the 80s. But gradually, this um, involvement has dwindled. People have moved away. They've relocated to Florida and other places. And, uh, but we still tr try to keep the organization going. So you've not been a bystander. You've been a participant in all of these organizations. I know in COCO, um, which I was involved with in some small way, that you were always there active. Uh, and so you saw your role not just as the woman behind the man, but you saw your role as an equal partner, obviously. Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how, how did you guys meet? Well, um, actually, I was at the Jamaica Labor Organ. At that time, it was the West Indies Labor Organization. And he came in, and um, the head of the organization was also Mr. Edwards. And Mr. Edwards brought him in and said, there's someone I would like you to meet. And so we met, and then I became involved in CAIO. And um, then um, later on, we became involved when he, he got his divorce, and I married him. But all this time, I've been um, involved in CAIO and working, working. I don't know if I can say beside him. <laughs> <laughs> but she, has, I was she has been my unpaid administrative officer. <laughs> <laughs> but Leo, could you have done it without um, Carmen? No, 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 no. Because the, uh, the, the, the administrative side of things mm -hmm. is of such, I could not have had. For example, even now, she has a computer. All I do from time to time, I go in and look to make sure that there is a computer. Mm -hmm. and that's my contribution. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. anything beyond that, mm -hmm. she, she does. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So th that is the reality. <laughs> yes, but um, as far as that is concerned, um, morning, noon, and night, you want something done on the computer? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're trying to go to bed and get some sleep, and he's, oh, send this email for me, but I would no need to get it off before, for before midnight, mm -hmm. or something of that sort. But uh, it has been interesting. And you see and yourself as 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 a as a as a couple, not just in terms of your personal life, but in terms of your public life. Yes, yes, right, yes. right, right. Oh yes, yes. But no, this has it, it. It has been a teamwork. That is what gets it done. Mm -hmm. Teamwork. Right. There is no, no one person, anybody who tells you that I did this by myself, something is wrong, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't work. It is, it is teamwork. And whether it is in whatever you're doing, 
you, because I have never met a human being from whom I could not learn something. And when we pool our resources together, then we achieve our goals much quicker and more effectively. Mm -hmm. As the wife of a celebrity, obviously <coughs> Leo is a celebrity um, icon in, 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 in the community, um, do you get to spend um, time away from the glare and enjoy the things that normal couples enjoy? Not as much as I'd like to. <laughs> um, usually when I get that kind of time is when we go to Jamaica. And then every, every year we leave around the 15th of December and we come back at the end of uh, January or early February. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the only time I really <laughs> have said, say, have him to myself. Right, he's not he's so not, much in demand. He's not so much in demand. He's not always going someplace, you know, uh -huh. unless we're both invited to some social functions or something, mm -hmm. or we're entertaining people at the house. But mm -hmm. that is the time I see most of him. Mistress and Mr. Leopold <laughs> Edwards, Mr. Scarmin Edwards, Mr. Leopold Edwards, certainly uh, one of the better known couples in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area of Caribbean descent. Leo, you have, um, I'm reading your resume here. You've worked as a research um, associate. You have founded um, seven, eight, nine organizations, all major organizations. You've been awarded, given uh, uh, what, seven, eight, nine high profile awards. You have uh, worked in the area of social science, worked in the area of psychology. You've been a consultant. You have all through these years met from Grantley Adams uh, and Norman Manley come right through to Stokely Carmichael and CLR James and all the icons who have passed through the uh, Washington DC metropolitan area. Uh, a full life, a full experience of the two of you. When are you going to write your memoirs? Well, I will leave that to others. I do not write or speak about myself. What I have done is a matter of history, and others will judge whether it has been worthwhile. I hope I have made some co small contributions to the progress of humanity. Leopold Edwards, icon of the Caribbean American uh, community in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, humble as they come, but certainly big in stature, a man who has contributed tremendously along with his wife to sustaining the Caribbean diaspora in a far off place that has now become a close place to home. Until the next time, this is David Hines thanking you for joining another program of Carib Nation. And remember, our motto on this program is one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation.